Amen. Hey. Praise the Lord. Can you tell the person beside you, I love you? I love you, Brother Marcus. Come on, guys. I love you. Hey, there you go. <laughs> As I always say, I love you, mwah mwah chup chup. <laughs> That's how I always say, I love you, then mwah mwah chup chup. <laughs> So I love you, my dear family. I hope that uh, we will continue uh, loving one another as we are a uh, one family of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Praise God. Send the light. What a wonderful message. Send the light. And uh, this morning, as we will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, we will be sending the light. <laughs> Question. Do you know what is one of the most important thing to God? What is the most important thing to God? The answer is, relationship family right family i always when i uh, call my family i tell them mi familia the love of my life <laughs> family relationship that's one of the most important things to god you know after God created Adam, the, the very first problem that God solved, you know what it is? Is loneliness. 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 In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. It is not good, Brother Joe, that you are alone. That's why God gave you Sister Joyce. Right? It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. In other translations, it says a suitable helper. Okay? A suitable helper. Somebody that will complement us men. Somebody that will complete us, man. Amen? Man, amen? Amen. <laughs> so, what's the solution? God created the women. God created Eve, right? So, God created Eve and that answered the problem of man loneliness and after that okay after god created eve so he created man then he created eve there's relationship and then after which god instituted what marriage see marriage family adam eve two became one relationship family. Now, another question is, why did God establish the church? Now, Brother Mike, where are you going at? You're talking about family, now you're talking about church. Okay. So, why did God establish the church? Well, there are many answers to that. But one answer is this. Family. It is to bind all believers as one spiritual family on earth in him. So the basic answer why God established his church is because family, relationship. In our scripture reading, 
See what God, what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. Do you know what the meaning of the word lavish? Well, I know you know the meaning of that. Okay. He gave it all to you. Right? He showered. He pampered you. Right? To the point that the reason why that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are children of God. And as children of God, we are family. We are family. And how do we become a children of God? John chapter 1. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become what? To become children of God. Those of you who received the Lord Jesus Christ into your hearts when you repented of your sins and when you were immersed through baptism, you became children of you become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of any man, but of God. You know, therefore, just like any physical families. In a physical family, we have what we call household, right? And each one of us, we belong to a particular household. Now, with the same idea, with the same principle, all members of the spiritual family of God belong to a household as well. But the only difference is we don't belong in different households. We belong to one household. And that is what? The church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in where? In the house of God. In other translation, in the household of God. Which is what? Which is the church. The church of the living God. We're in... There is the pillar and the ground of truth. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, that's the reason. One reason why God established the church is because to have a family here on earth. If we have our own family, if we have our own physical family, our own household, Therefore, God wants his own household, and that is the church. And that is you and I. Now, just like in any family, generally, the family consists of the father, the mother, the brother, and the sister. Right? Now, the essence of the church is also like that. It's about relationship. It's about family. In Matthew chapter 12, 49 and 50, and stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is what? Is my brother, is my sister, and my mother. Brother Mike, can I call my sister my mother? Yes. Jesus called the believers, the women, his mother. So I can call my sisters my mother. Like Sister Faith. I can call her my mother. My spiritual mother. Right? But we only have one father in heaven. So there is what we call the father, the brother, the sister, and the mother. Just like in any family. And just like in any family, the sisters and the brothers, they are heirs. Right? So also... As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all heirs. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So all that there is in a physical family, there is in a spiritual family. Now, when you want to grow, the church of Christ, when we want to grow the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we evangelize, may I encourage all of you to think about this. To think about this word. 
family. Family. The way we evangelize, the way you do your evangelism, may you think about family. Now, by having the essence of this word in our hearts and in our minds, we might change the way we do our evangelism. We might change the way we talk to people because now we're not thinking them as just somebody. We're not thinking them as part of the family. Now, we might do something different this time in our approach because now you are talking to someone that you want that person to be part of God's family. Again, we will be talking about my family, you, the church. We are family, right? Or you don't want me part of the family? <laughs> we are family, right? Yes. Amen. Come on. Where's the energy? We are family, right? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hey, Brother James, I hope you're, you're watching. I hope you're in the amen corner. <laughs> Right? We are family. So be excited. We are family. You know, as God's creation, the reality is we have two families, whether you like it or not. We have two families. Brother Mike, what is the two families? Number one, you have your physical families. Right? You are born with it. But the problem is you have no choice. Right? You have no choice. Do you have a choice, Brother, Brother Joe? Did you have a choice? No, you were born to that family, whether you like it or not, right? Brother Michael, do you have a choice? No, you just have to accept it, right? Amen. We don't have a choice for our physical families. But here's the other good news and another bad news. The second family is our spiritual family. There you have a choice. There you have a choice. In our, in our spiritual families, there are actually two, two spiritual families. One is, as we mentioned earlier, the household of God. God being our father in heaven, right? But the bad news is, the other spiritual families is, if you want to go to, with Satan, with the devil, right? You have no choice. But when you were born, you have no choice. Whether you were born, you were born in a bad family or a good family, you have no choice. You just have to live with it. But now you have a choice. You have a choice whether you want to go to, with God or you want to go with the father, the liar, the devil. Right? In John chapter 8, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. Of course, I'm not talking to you. Those that are out of the church, <laughs> they are of their father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks a lie from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. See, you have a choice whether you want to go with God or you want to go with the devil. Now, when, when Jesus Christ gave us the great commission, you know what? It was a call for a family affair, whether you like it or not. It was a call for a family affair, a family reunion. We all love to have our family reunion, right? We want to share our families, our clan. Great Commission is about calling your family into the household of God. He wants our physical families to be also into the spiritual family called the church. I want you to remember that. And as we do the Great Commission, now here are some ways in which to evangelize. Again, as we evangelize, we think of family. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Okay. This is a principle that I learned many years ago. You know, 
I read and read and read about this particular verse. And have you ever noticed when you read a particular verse or verses over and over and over and over again, you know, somehow the meaning changes, right? The meaning somehow goes deeper and deeper and deeper. It's not superficial anymore. And somehow you are getting a more revelation, so to speak, from God regarding the meaning. It goes deeper and you now have a broader meaning, a broader view of what that particular verse that you are reading pertains to. And the more I read about this verse, it talks to me about evangelism. How? Now. It says there, Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, number one. You know, Jerusalem represents the heart of Christianity. Okay? That is where Jesus almost did his ministry. Okay? And when he was 12 years old, he was at Jerusalem in the temple, preaching, teaching to the rabbis, to the teachers of the law. So Jerusalem is like the heart of Christianity. Now, this tells me that the heart of our evangelism must start within what is close to us. Must start to where true love is. Must start where our heart is. And do you know where your heart is? Your heart is where your family is. Evangelism must start with Jerusalem. Must start within where our heart is. Must start at the core. Must start within the family. Before we go out so many miles away, we must start within the family. And that is what Jesus is telling us. You shall be witnesses to me first in Jerusalem. Be a witness for God. Be a witness for Jesus Christ where your heart is. In Jerusalem, inside the family. In your loved ones. That is where we should start our evangelism. If we want to grow the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned earlier Jesus wants the church to be a family affair. Our family must be also inside the church. Let us not exclude our family. If you so love your family, then you will do whatever it is in your power, so to speak, to make them be part of this great family of the Lord, His church. If you're going for a vacation, are you going to leave your family behind? Or are you going to bring your family with you? Of course, I would like to bring my family with me. I will bring my family with me so that we will enjoy, you know, bathing on the sun, right? Bring your family with you. So if you are having this spiritual journey with the Lord, and if you are inside the church, why not bring your family with you? Why not let them also enjoy what you are enjoying? I am enjoying Jesus Christ. That's why I have my family with me. If you are enjoying Jesus Christ, why not bring along your family and have them also enjoy Jesus Christ? Amen. Bring them with you. As servants of God, and I keep on telling this, Our ministry must be our family first. Family first ministry. Now let's take a look at the family of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 6 verse 3, Is not this carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? In other uh, translation, the word Joseph or Jose is Joseph. And are not his sisters here with us? 
and they took offense at him. Now, the reason why I mentioned about this is because I want you to see that Jesus Christ also have other brothers okay, and sisters. Now, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, I will not get into details about what happens, what happened to the family of Jesus Christ, but here's what I'm going at. Now, church history will tell us that the family of Jesus Christ were pretty much involved in the ministry. But in the Bible, such as this one, the name of his brother James were a little bit more prominent than the other of his siblings. But in some other scriptures, the other siblings of Jesus Christ were referred to as the brothers of our Lord. Okay. But the thing is, evangelism, ministry, Christianity is a family affair. Jesus made sure that all his siblings, his family was included in the ministry. Now look at what the apostles did or before they become apostles. In John chapter 1, 14, 42, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two, he the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon. And what? And tell him, we found the Messiah. Yes, we found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. You see, evangelism should be a family affair. When you found Jesus Christ, it should be a family affair. You should be rejoicing like Andrew did. Woohoo! I found Jesus Christ. Here it is. Here is Jesus Christ with me. Listen to him. In John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, then leaving her water, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made the their way toward him. You know, the Samaritan woman, you know, went to where her heart was. He went to where her heart was. Where was it? In her hometown, where, his, where her family, loved ones, and friends were. So he went back and announced, could this be the Messiah? Come on out. Listen to him. And the latter part of John chapter 4, John chapter 4 tells us many believe and follow Jesus Christ. You see, it's a family affair. Wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. Now, here's another beautiful display of family evangelism. In Acts chapter 10, verse 24, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea pertaining to Peter. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. You see, here was a man, a devout man, a God-fearing man, a generous man, a prayerful man. When he had a vision from God that God would be sending Peter to him, you know, because God would, would do something for him because God heard his prayers. God saw what he was doing. And Cornelius, knowing that Peter would be coming to him, did not, he did not want the conversation with Peter, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, just a private conversation. No. He wants all the people, his household, his friends, he wants it to be a family affair. Look, he called together his relatives and close friends. Hey, come on, guys. 
Peter is coming over. Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, God sent Peter to me. And he will have a blessing for every one of us. He brings good tidings. Come on. It's a family affair. In verse 48, so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Wow. See? In Acts chapter 16, the story of Lydia. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city, city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. This was Paul and Silas. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Theatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Paul and Silas, they were talking to the women. To the women. And it so happened that Lydia was there. She was a worshiper of God and the Lord opened her heart. And when, he, when she opened her heart to the Lord, she cannot contain the joy. She cannot contain the joy. And what she did, when she and the members of her household were baptized, probably, probably her household, her family members were just nearby when where Paul and Silas were talking to them. And when she heard the good news, she cannot contain herself. And she talked to her household. She brought all her household and told them the good news. And look at what happened. When she and the members of her household were baptized, they were baptized into Christ. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? And she invited them over. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Probably Lydia have other relatives in her house that she wanted them to be baptized also, that she wanted them to be saved as well. You see, evangelism ministry is a family first ministry. We must include the family. It's a family affair. Another interesting story. The jailer, the jailer called for lights, rushed in and felt trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Now the jailer, the jailer knew who Paul and Silas were. Okay? And the jailer could have heard Jesus through Paul and Silas because during the night, Paul and Silas, they were praying and they were singing inside the jail. Every time, every night, they prayed and sang. Okay? And the jailer fell down. When there was like an earthquake and the gates were open, the jailer, the jailer fell down in front of Paul and Silas and asked the very important question that each and every one of us should be asking. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer knew that Paul and Silas had the answer. And what he did was remarkable. He made salvation a family affair. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and you in your household. Now, in verses 32 and 33 of Acts 16, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to the jailer, not also, not only Sorry, not only to him, but also to the others in his house. <clears throat> Amen. In his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately 
he and all his household were baptized. The jailer made sure that it will be a family affair. I will not only be the one to be saved or be saved. I want my family be saved as well. I will make this a family affair. And lo and behold, the jailer and his household, they were baptized. Amen. He made sure that salvation be also be upon his family. That the grace and mercy of God would also fall upon the entire household. The entire household. You see, from being a person in charge of the prisoner, the jailer now becomes the prisoner himself. The prisoner of Jesus Christ. Amen. He became a prisoner of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, can you picture this a bit with me? Okay. Picture this. Um, here's the scenario. What happened inside that, that uh, prison facility? Okay. The jailer, okay, the jailer, he washed the wounds and the stripes of Paul and Silas. And that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed of their wounds. Imagine the jailer washing the wounds and the stripes of Paul and Silas. Right? Now, here's the good news. After the jailer washed Paul and Silas' wounds and stripes, it was now his wounds. It was now his stripes that was washed away. By Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It was now his wounds and his stripes because he was baptized into Christ. His sins now were washed away by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. The beauty of making evangelism a family affair. Not only himself but his entire household were saved during that night. Wow. Now let me take your attention to these words. And I want to point out, um, as, we, as we take a look at these words, as we evangelize, I want you to think about the family. Personal evangelism. Some people call evangelism as personal evangelism. What is the meaning of personal evangelism? Well, simply put, personal evangelism, it is sharing the gospel with someone else. That's how the basic definition of personal evangelism is. Now, I want everybody to look at the word personal. Personal evangelism. I want all of us to make evangelism personal. Taking things personally usually happens, you know, when, when we've been criticized somehow or when we are insulted by someone else, which hurts our ego, and we take it personal. Okay? And that's not what I'm talking about. Being personal is that we, we, we take out the negative things. Okay? We take out the negative things by making it personal. What I meant was Investing emotionally, our emotion, emotionally being invested to that person. Our emotion being invested in what we do. Meaning we put genuine love into what you do. When you go out and evangelize, make it personal. Make it personal, put your love to it. Because you are evangelizing to your family. Okay. Make it your lifelong mission. Until, you know, that person receives Jesus Christ or you breath your last, whichever comes first. Make it a lifelong mission. Okay. Invest emotionally as you make it a personal. Make it personal. Okay. As they say, learning should start where? Learning should start at home. Education. 
should start at home, in the family. Okay? Our kids should start learning in the family, at home. Good manners and right conduct, or GMRC as we call it back home. Good manners and right conduct should start where? Should start at home, in the family. But unfortunately, many families everywhere in this world send their kids to school to learn. That's good. There's nothing wrong about it. But we don't bother to teach them at home. You know why? Because number one, we are too busy. Number two, we are so tired. I'm so tired, I don't have, I don't have any time. You know, being tired is a subtle way of saying I'm too lazy. And number three, that's why I send them to school so that they can learn. That's why they have the institution. All right. That is right. You send them to school to learn, but not for good morals and right character, but not for godly character. You teach them that it at home. We teach the kids at home about being godly, about having right character. And then when they grow up, and having a bad character, and then you will ask yourself, what happened to you? Well, you sent me out there to learn, and this is what I got. You see, what do we say? There's a famous quote, charity begins where? Where? At home. Charity begins at home. But lo and behold, most of our children Grew up to be agnostic, grew up to be atheist, you know, grew up to be, it doesn't care about you so much. Because we let the world teach them, because we let the world mold them. Why? Because we are too busy. We are so tired, right? But we say charity begins at home. We always say that charity begins at home. And that should be the case. Charity should begin at home. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Who would train a child to be more godly, to become godly? The world or you? Of course, we are. The family. The love of my life. Mi familia. Right? We should be teaching our children the godly way. It should start from home. Evangelism should start from home. You see, people are doing what is contrary to the scripture. We let the world train our children. We must do the training for righteousness of our children and for our family. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood from childhood, and they, who they, later you will see who they are, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Who are they? Paul was talking to Timothy. How from his childhood he learned of the scriptures from they, from them, from his grandmother, Louis, and from his mother, Eunice. It's a family affair. Christianity should be a family affair. Evangelism should be a family affair. should start from the family. Have you ever shared the gospel, my dear brethren, to the point of crying, to the point of shedding tears? I know I did. I've shed a lot of tears. I'm not saying, I'm saying that, you know, just to boost myself. No. I'm saying that because out of love, out of, I have invested so many emotions in evangelism. I cried and shed so many tears for, for my family members. I begged to them. I begged to some of my friends, to my loved ones. I begged to them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, to read your Bible every day. To learn of the truth. I shed many tears. Because I love them. I love them. 
you know, even people who just listen to you, even if they will help you, hate you for doing that, go ahead. Why? Because you love them. You love them. And soon, soon, God will open their hearts by, great, by the grace and mercy of the Lord. They will soon open their hearts just like what other people did, just like what I did. When people evangelized, when people knock at their doors, on my doors, eventually I opened my heart. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on your loved ones. Don't give up on your friends. Don't give up on your family members. If they, were, they will not listen to you now, don't give up on them. Remember, Jesus Christ never gave up on you. Did he? He never gave up on you. He never gave up on you. Look, the Lord said, I stand. I stand at the door. I keep on knocking. I am shouting at the, at the top of my voice. I am at your door, the door of your heart. I stand and knock. And whoever opens and hears my voice and opens the door of his heart, I will come in and have a meal with him. And me and him will be friends. You see, Jesus Christ never gave up on me. He never gave up on you. So why give up on your loved ones? Even if they will not listen today, come back to them tomorrow. Come back to them. Even if they are tired of listening to you, don't be tired of talking to them. Don't be tired of sharing the gospel to them because you love them. Jesus never tired of loving us. He loved us. He never gave up on us. Brethren, be passionate about Jesus Christ. Be passionate about your loved ones. Be passionate about your love for everybody. Now, may I suggest these things. In our household, have a scheduled prayer. Have a scheduled prayer. Be intentional. Have a scheduled prayer. Have a quiet time. You and your family, talk about life. Enjoy the things that you enjoy the most. Talk about things that you, you guys enjoy, you guys love talking about. You know, have a, a prayer time, have a Bible study. Have those things in your home. Inculcate those things in the minds of your children. Make it personal. Make it personal. A quick story about a brother back home that I've known so many years. Uh, he, he already passed away. When he was alive, every day, every day for so many years, every, I think every seven in the morning, every day, he would play a gospel song. He would play gospel songs and he would read the scripture every day from seven and it will run for 30 or 45 minutes. He would play every day. And at first, people were annoyed. Hey! Hey, man! Can you lower the volume? Hey! Please shut it off. Nobody's listening to you. But he never listened to them. He just kept playing every day, every morning, and he would... Magandang umaga. And he would say, magandang umaga. That's good morning. And he would read the scriptures to them while having his coffee and pandesal, what we call the, uh, the bread roll. Okay. Every morning, every morning. And guess what? It paid off. People were baptized. And people were coming to church. He did that for so many years until one day, until one day, people noticed something's wrong. Because one day, the people were expecting. Because they're accustomed to it. They're looking forward to it every day. Yeah. And then one day, he was not playing. And they said something wrong. And there was indeed something wrong. He had a, a heart attack, I think. Stroke, and he died. In the community, they were all sad. Because every day, for so many years, I don't know how many years, for so many years, every day, 
the people were accustomed in hearing the gospel and hearing him pray and read the scriptures. The scripture. And every Sunday, he will go up to his microphone and he will say, good morning, everybody. It's time to praise the Lord. Please come. We'll have the service at nine o'clock in the morning. You are all invited to worship and praise God. Every Sunday and every morning he would play. See? Don't give up. Don't give up. Again, this brother of ours achieved what he was supposed to achieve because evangelism became personal. Now finally, my dear brethren, let us approach evangelism with the same mindset. If we want to grow the church, let us make a family affair. Let us make it a family affair. Even if your husband don't want to come with you, even if your children don't want to come with you, don't want to listen to you, don't listen to them. Just give them the word. Eventually, eventually they will listen. Eventually they will listen. And pray for them that soon that God will open their hearts. I will lead you or leave you with this final verse from the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 5 to 9. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be born on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as a symbols on your hands and bind them, bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. My dear brethren, the gospel is yours. May God bless us all. For those of you that are here and are listening to our Zoom, to our platform, who have not yet accepted the Lord, we invite you to come forward. Let your voice be heard and be a part of this wonderful family of the Lord. Repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation?